You're listening to Pre-Market Prep. I'm Brianna Valeski sitting in for Joel L. Kahn, and I'm joined by the Reverend Emmanuel Lemelson. He's the Chief Investment Officer at Lemelson Capital Management. Father Lemelson, thanks for joining us this Friday morning. Nice to be with you, Brianna. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. Last time you were on the show, we spoke about Greece, and you had some really great insight on that. I'd love to get an update from you and just get your take on how things have unfolded since then. Sure. Um, Well, since we spoke last time, which I think was June 5th, Brianna, um, Greece has held their referendum, obviously. And um, Greece essentially put um, their proposals for uh, further austerity measures to a vote for the Greek people. And uh, I don't think Greece has had a national referendum since like 1974. And Mm -hmm. essentially what happened is that um, Tsipras um, did this unilaterally. He didn't give any warning really to the Troika. And, but he gave, I think it was the right thing to do because he really gave the Greek people an opportunity to weigh in how they felt. And, um, you know, of course, Samaras had his reputation on the line. Uh, but uh, it was a simple referendum. It really asked the Greek people to vote uh, based on these additional measures, these 10 points that uh, the ECB and the IMF had proposed uh, and Junkers. And, um, you know, they voted no, obviously. I mean, in Greek, the word is ochi. And that has a special meaning for Greeks because, um, frankly, ochi day, which is... Uh, a very important day uh, uh, for Greeks, marking their independence. Mm. Um, and so for the Greeks, when they, they talk about voting Oki, they, they're really talking about their independence from what has become almost uh, uh, financial servitude uh, in this situation. And the vote was really lopsided. I, mean, it was, I think it was 63% was no and uh, 37% was yes. Uh, and so uh, that was, I believe, July 5th. So we'll see what's going to happen now. But in terms of the country itself, uh, it's important to recognize it's not just an economic issue. These people are really suffering. Uh, I've got a lot of friends there, and they say it's really bad. Uh, you could imagine, I mean, we're going on several weeks now where these folks can only get 50 or $60 a day out of the ATMs. Uh, and you've probably seen the civil unrest in, in Syntagma Square and so forth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, really interesting to see even the clergy have weighed in. Uh, you've got, you know, Orthodox priests there in Syntagma Square. You've got the hierarchy of the Church of Greece weighing in, uh, very deliberately saying that they're, you know, they, they feel the vote should be yes, that Greece should stay in the euro. Uh, we'll see where it goes, but my position uh, personally, maybe not the popular one, has always been that uh, Greece probably better off leaving the eurozone um, and reasserting control over their currency. Uh, it's an enormous amount of debt. Accountability, I mean, <clears throat> but when we talk about accountability, I think it's probably a bit of a straw man to say, well, they borrowed the money, they need to pay it back, mm-hmm. uh, because there were a lot of profits off engineering Greece's balance sheet uh, with these currency swaps and so forth. And so the other side of the equation is who lent the money uh, and is their accountability greater uh, and did they profit from it? And and the answer is yes. I mean, probably the closest analog we have in recent economic history is the housing bubble in the United States. Um, There was obviously what we call the foreclosure crisis. It affected millions of Americans and resulted in the largest peak to trough decline in housing since the early 1930s. the initial reaction, you know, by 2009, 2010, by pundits was, well, American homeowners borrowed too much, uh, shame on them. But that's really, a, again, a straw man. Uh, the reality was you had some very smart people on Wall Street uh, designing these uh, synthetic CDOs and selling them uh, in tranches as um, uh, tax-exempt bond offerings um, under what's called a remix status. Uh, those guys made billions of dollars. So, uh, you know, is the homeowner who bought too much house uh, during the, the run-up in the housing uh, boom and bubble, was he accountable? Sure. Uh, was the guy who packaged uh, these RMBSs and often sold uh, fraudulent mortgages into multiple trusts, is he more accountable for driving up prices? Oh, absolutely. And I think the same could be said of Greece. Um, the Greek people have some accountability, uh, but, uh, you know, not nearly the accountability of, unfortunately, our financial institutions here in the U.S., that helped create the situation and profited from it. Wow, that's a great point that I haven't heard anyone bring up yet, just comparing it to the housing bubble with all these people that were given subprime mortgages. And yeah, obviously, you know, the Greece did agree to these debt agreements, but it's also on the people who structured them in such a way that Greece is now suffering and they're profiting off of off of the suffering from Greece. But let's let's turn our focus to a little closer to home. We've talked about all sorts of companies on the show before and specifically Alibaba. 
uh, back in January, you know, you mentioned that investors should probably stay away from newer issues like Alibaba. Uh, you know, the sellers, Alibaba sellers, includes insiders and investment banks, have a vested interest in selling to you at a price they know is above the value. You know, uh, since you said that in January, like Alibaba's down, what, 20%? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it, it's interesting, Brian. I mean, obviously, in that time, there's also been um, this huge uh, decline in, in Asian equities as well. Mm -hmm. And but, you know, the great financial historian Kenneth Galbraith once said, uh, he, he's the author of The Crash of '29. Uh, he said, you know, you know, you're in a bubble when every person believes it's their God-given right to get rich, and yeah. um, that's interesting. That. Wow. So. You could imagine if you were living in Shanghai uh, just 60 days ago, I mean, you went to a cocktail party, people are probably talking about what stocks they owned or bought or sold. Mm -hmm. um, and when there's a huge amount of leverage when they're buying common stocks uh, using leverage and they can tell you a little more than the ticker symbol, you know, you might be in a bubble. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's also interesting the rate at which IPOs pick up in a bubble. And that's certainly the case in, in, in China. But, you know, you would ask yourself if the Chinese market is so robust and, and, you know, otherwise more or less closed, why are these Asian companies coming to the U.S. to IPO? And I think the idea um, that we're going to go into a foreign land to discover riches is a very ancient one. I mean, it's existed for thousands of years. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you find references in the gospel, frankly, uh, to this notion. And... Um, I think it looked exotic, right, to the average investor. I mean, wow, we're going to participate in the China story. Um, but there's another adage that uh, what the wise do in the beginning, the fool does in the end. Uh, by the time an issue comes to the retail investor, um, you know, everyone else has already made their money mm -hmm. off it, frankly. Uh, and it's really it's a transfer. I mean, it's, it's the people on the inside uh, <laughs> reallocating their equity stake and diversifying to maybe less critical buyers. And so when you see these big IPOs coming, uh, I'm not a big fan of IPOs ever, frankly. Um, there's so many issues to choose from with mature long-term track records online. But um, especially when you have one coming out of China with all the, the promotion associated with it and all the, the, the glamour of, you know, they're really, they're not talking to, you know, the sharpest cats on Wall Street. They're, they're trying to talk to the average Joe with a, an E-Trade account and mm. he gets really seduced by that kind of thing. So I would say be very careful. And, you're right. I mean, it's not about 25% since those comments were made. So uh, it turned out to be pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Apple, we're going to get their earnings report next week. Um, you know, you've, you've always made some great calls on just everything from earnings reports to what we're going to see out of their unit sales. Uh, what are you looking for in Apple right now? Well, uh, you know, again, an amazing company. Um, you look at some of the analogs right now in their peer group. I'm not sure they have an exact peer group because of their size, but mm -hmm. you look at what Google's trading at or, or Netflix or Amazon or something like that, and it still looks awfully cheap, Brianna. But, you know, I, I'm guessing they're going to sell over 50 million phones this quarter, which would be another record for their uh, third quarter, mm -hmm. fiscal third quarter. Um, you know, they are di diversifying into different business. I mean, probably if there's a criticism of Apple, it's that so much of their, their revenue is tied up in I, the iPhone uh, franchise. Um, and that's true, but I mean, they're also making tremendous headway and, and I think what they're going to do with TV, the new Apple TV will come out and, uh, you know, Apple pay is really just catching on like crazy. Um, they're sowing uh, seeds with they'll reap a huge reward in the future by, um, what, what they've done with Swift, their programming language, making it open source. Um, you know, whether or not the Apple watch works or not, I'm not sure, but I've heard nothing but good things about it. It's, they don't break it out. Uh, they're probably not going to break it out on, on this conference call on Tuesday, uh, but that's okay. Um, you, you know, I made some comments on our last interview on June 5th that I think people talk about, analysts talk about tough year-over-year -year comparisons for iPhone sales. I, I completely disagree. I think as that install base in, in, improves in size and grows, it snowballs, nothing could be easier than forecasting the upgrade cycle. And um, you know, your, your phone gets to be about a year or two old and the battery life really degrades. Mm -hmm. And um, it's such an incredibly important tool for most people in their day-to-day -day life. Oh, people yeah. are going to upgrade. And importantly, people just never leave that ecosystem. I, they just don't. And so, uh, you know, I think Google and Android have to worry about that. We talked in the past about some of these dynamics, how no company really controls the hardware and the software and also controls both mobile and desktop. Uh, Apple's doing all those things. I mean, they're growing their PC business in a market that's in, in, in really in tremendous decline. 
And um, it's really an extraordinary thing. I mean, you, they've got an install base that probably exceeds 450 million users worldwide. There's no evidence it's slowing down. And um, these are people who are not only going to be upgrading their, their hardware devices, they're going to be buying services. I mean, especially in China, where that business is just doing an incredible job. They've got... <clears throat> um, uh, you can just imagine that even if China's economy uh, were to go into recession, uh, you know, I think people would keep spending in that area. I mean, I, I recall <laughs> having a conversation a few years ago with a close friend of mine in Greece. Uh, he, he's a monk, to tell you the truth, and mm -hmm. he, he's a very, very holy man, actually. And he just said to me, he said, Father, um, even if I didn't pay my mortgage on my, my little apartment there in Athens, I, I, you know, I would, I would avoid paying my mortgage if, if it meant you know, I could get the new iPhone. <laughs> At that time, I, I realized, you know, Apple really has <laughs> almost like a tractor beam on people. I mean, yeah. they, they're going to spend money on it. And X Cash, that thing is still trading at like 11 or 12 forward earnings. I mean, uh, that's extremely cheap. I, I think the market's going to figure it out. Uh, if you're looking at a, a discounted cash flow model and you include assets of the company, you could value this thing at like 210 to $240 a share probably today. I wouldn't be that aggressive myself, but, um, you know, I'd say maybe 175, 185, but it, it's still really cheap. They're paying a dividend too, and they've got this huge buyback. So, in terms of the things we can know versus the things we can't know, uh, you know, we don't know where the market is going to go tomorrow or whether China's going into a recession or anything like that, but we know that Apple has buybacks and they use them, and they have about 50 billion left on their current authorization. So, um, you know, that, that's going to help ongoing owners. Yeah, I think you you bring up so all of the great points fundamentally about Apple. I mean, there's an immense amount of brand loyalty. They have dominance in mobile and in home computer, especially just like with, with investors have huge concerns about cybersecurity and Android phones are really well known for getting hacked and having security issues with that. So there's great points it, it, about it, Apple. You a good point, Anna. I mean, I, I've always felt the enterprise is a huge opportunity for them, and I think that's what we see happening. And uh, I think we see it in... in um, the latest versions of OS X and OS S9, I mean, uh, and the partnership with IBM, the, the emphasis in the last couple of years on um, security, I, I think what they're doing is they're really setting up to take over the desktop completely. Really? And I think that's where it's going. Wow. And they're going to do that through IBM. I think that's how they're going to insert sort of their DNA into the enterprise. All right. That's a great point. Watch out for uh, Apple taking over the desktop entirely, guys. Um, what about the tech sector as a whole? Before we got on the live show, you mentioned that you were seeing it as a little overvalued. You know, we're kind of speculating that Google had a better than expected earnings report yesterday. So it kind of looks like the entire tech sector, although it's been going up for a while now. But uh, what's your view on that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 been a bull market, I mean, for five or six years. Um, not all these companies are overpriced by any means, but you do have situations where valuations seem very high. Um, you, you know, Tesla and Netflix and so forth. Um, actually, just took a short position in Netflix yesterday, Did for you? better or for worse. Uh, you know, could they maintain an outrageous multiple and uh, profile for the next 10 years? Maybe. I mean, Amazon's done it, but Amazon's somewhat more diversified and, and than a Netflix. Um, you, you know, I mean, a lot of things drove the market up in the last five or six years, Brianna. Low interest rates is chief among them, obviously. Um, and so did things like buybacks. And I see that tapering off now. I mean, both them, obviously interest rates are going to go up, and the buyback thing is going to wind down. It's sort of played out. So what's going to drive um, the ability of a lot of these tech companies to maintain these valuations? Not totally clear, but as much as I don't like shorting, frankly, I'd rather be short most of these names uh, for the rest of 2015 than to be uh, long. And um, I do see a number of different smaller, I mean, China, obviously a bubble. I mean, that's, I, I think it's undisputable now with this contraction, it was 30% contraction. But then you see, you know, small biotech, you see some of these tech names and so forth. There's a lot of um, hope about the future. And the thing about technology is it's, it's uniquely difficult to invest in technology. It's not that technology won't improve the future, it will. It's that we don't really know which company will commercialize it. So when you're looking at cutting edge technology <clears throat> or paradigm shift, I mean, nobody flies in an airplane made by the Wright brothers. But the Wright brothers were geniuses. I mean, <laughs> you would have thought Wright Aviation was going to be the future, but we don't. We, we fly in airplanes made by Boeing and, and Airbus and so forth. So uh, we don't really know. Uh, and when, when you look at a company like a Netflix, uh, you know, brilliant leadership and brilliant vision, uh, really small earnings, you know, huge market cap you know, 45 billion or something like that, and they're boasting 65 million registered users. Now that's fantastic, but uh, you've got Apple really pushing into that business, and they've got something like seven or 800 million registered users with their credit cards ready to go. Um, 
you know, not clear at all that there's a defendable moat there. So probably a really unpopular opinion, but these things, you know, they oftentimes they don't look like bubbles until it's too late and it's in hindsight. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I feel totally comfortable being short a lot of these companies that are very popular. You know, if you're seeing the name every day on your homepage of CNBC, uh, somebody's promoting it and for good cause. Yeah, that's a very good you're point. You're talking about a P&E ratio, I think, of 263 on a forward basis for Netflix. I mean, that, that's really hard to justify. Right. Right, absolutely. We've been on the line with Reverend Emmanuel Lemelson. He's the Chief Investment Officer of Lemelson Capital Management. Father Lemelson, thanks so much for joining us this morning. As always, we really appreciate your insight, and we'll absolutely have to have you back on again soon. Wonderful being with you, Brianna. You guys are doing a fantastic job, and thank you so much for the invitation. God bless.